So, Vadim, should, should, should we get started? Do you want to start the, the panel discussion? If you oh. don't <clears throat> so, uh, uh, good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, uh, I was not, um, I did not participate in this program, so it's especially interesting for me what is uh, the result and how to implement this result in the future work. So I guess that there will be very interesting discussion on this uh, because we have a lot of uh, interesting um, question uh, to solve in the nearest future in our region. And um, I guess that participants would be very active. And uh, uh, what do you uh, think, Jen? Well, Vadim, if you can give a little bit of your own background, I think people will be interested and get you your profile uh, understood. Uh, uh, we obviously know you, but... Uh, uh, do, uh, you think it's necessary to introduce myself? <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, uh, I'm very old uh, <laughs> um, infectionist and uh, I work for HIV inf uh, for infection since uh, a, uh, since uh, seventy. Eight and uh, I started work on AIDS in uh, eighty four, so about uh, thirty five, more than thirty five years ago, and also we of course work with other uh, chronic infection, which is uh, obvious are uh, combined with HIV infection such as TB, hepatitis B and C. So this is uh, maybe my profile, sur mainly surveillance, but also because uh, on base I am infectionist, I also work on clinical trials, on uh, new drugs, on HIV infection, hepatitis B, C, herpes cester and other infections. So I have a long experience <laughs> in science connected to this infection and uh, yeah, on surveillance uh, covered all this problem. And uh, so, of course, uh, scientific uh, program are especially interesting for me because uh, my main book, of course, sci science, science, scientific research. And uh, I published uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, articles in Russian, so, and uh, I hope that my experience in Eastern Europe would be very useful for uh, today's discussion. Absolutely, Madam. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, hi, everybody. My name is Jens Langren. Uh, uh, I'm a professor in the University of Copenhagen uh, and have been uh, privileged to uh, lead the, the scientific activities within CARE. Uh, um, uh, over the last uh, three three years, and uh, I just first of all want to thank everybody uh, that was contributing to the session earlier today. It, as you heard from the presentation, there has been a wide variety of activities, uh, research activities, and collaborations uh, performed uh, during the conduct of care. Uh, we have uh, worked on biomarkers for early diagnosis of TB. Uh, we have worked on uh, improvement in um, <clears throat> drug susceptibility uh, against uh, TB, a uh, pressing uh, public health uh, issue uh, where we still uh, are short on good uh, and helpful Im implementable uh, technologies. Uh, use of bioinformatic uh, analysis, uh, uh, I think, was really um, a tremendous uh, advantage uh, of, uh, of as part of, of care to, to see that coming through. And thanks to the group in uh, Brussels in, in Germany for, uh, for, for taking their expertise into care. Uh, we've heard a lot about uh, the subtype A6 uh, of HIV that is dominating uh, uh, <clears throat> the landscape of transmission, in particular in Eastern Europe, uh, a virus that uh, had major public impact, but little 
relatively little research done uh, so far. Uh, and I think CARE has been able to contribute with significant insights, uh, thanks to many people uh, uh, led by Anna Sonebo and, um, and Mauricio uh, and other colleagues. Um, you've heard about, <clears throat> I think for the first time, although Europe has been uh, developing uh, prospective cohort studies now for 30 years, uh, we here, by the help uh, and collaboration, uh, have been able to also include uh, several uh, sites uh, within the Russian Federation as part of a prospective cohort study, uh, which is still ongoing. Uh, a lot of people were essential uh, in making this happen. Uh, I want to uh, acknowledge Marina um, uh, from Moscow, who has been really helpful in in helping out with the coordination uh, to make this happen. It's a uh, it's not easy to establish a prospective cohort study uh, of clinicians who may not be used to that sort of collaboration. But I, I think everybody really stepped up to it. Uh, um, also, uh, of course, uh, the colleagues in my own group who was part of, uh, of uh, seeing this through. As you know, we have, um, as part of that prospective co uh, cohort study, have been collecting host DNA, uh, <clears throat> which is currently being uh, uh, processed uh, for generation of ho host genetic uh, uh, characterization, uh, something that has not been established before, who have uh, now been done. Um, and as you know, uh, any prospect, prospect, prospective cohort, it's like a good, um, a good wine. Don't drink it too early, uh, because the longer it takes, the, the better it actually gets. Uh, uh, so uh, I think we're just getting started on that. Uh, you ho heard how that cohort can be used for informing, you know, public health questions such as pub, uh, the cascade of care, uh, getting insights into that and the uh, the complexity of the situation uh, um, in different regions and also within countries. Uh, you heard about um, viral hepatitis, uh, an extraordinary cohort of uh, patients from many uh, countries uh, have been joining up uh, uh, and contributing data really for the first time. Uh, um, in generating a, a large database on people who were treated with the uh, direct acting uh, antivirals and, and therefore establishing a benchmark for uh, how to treat that infection uh, um, uh, within Europe, uh, including Eastern Europe and, um, and Central Asia. So uh, I think there's been a lot of, of activities here. Uh, and, and the purpose of, of this panel discussion uh, is to, to really take from what you heard today and see how we can use that moving forward. Was this a, a good process? Uh, was this a, a helpful process? Uh, if so, how was it helpful? Um, not only obviously for the aspect of generating uh, concrete science articles, but also uh, for, for the prospect of actually uh, establishing collaborations and uh, getting people to talk to each other. I would really love to hear the panel give you a way in uh, on that. Uh, and, and why was it possible to do? Uh, because we have been wanting for years to establish strong collaborations also with colleagues in Russia. We have we have good friends in, in Russia, but uh, uh, this is really the first time that we have engaged in something where we are actually generating data together and, and, and working on, on data, which obviously is the fundament of research. Why was that possible? Uh, I would really love to hear the panel uh, perspective on that and what you, um, what you think and whether we should uh, do this. And needless to say, CARE was had a, <laughs> great aspirations uh, when we started. Uh, none of us had anticipated that the world will be affected by a pandemic in the middle of it. Uh, um, <clears throat> the fact that the projects have actually been able to continue despite uh, significant uh, deviation of focus and resources uh, to handle the pandemic throughout uh, uh, Europe, um, I think it's a testament to the the seriousness of, of people getting together. Um, but of course, 
this may not be the last time we are hit by a pandemic and and the panel's discussion and reflections on that by establishing collaborations, we can do more than what is actually in front of us in terms of concrete uh, projects, because we, by collaboration, have actually established a platform for having dialogue and therefore help each other to deal with new um, wild threats. And uh, I think uh, most of the research that has been derived around SARS-CoV-2 has actually come from research entities that have been involved with working on on HIV uh, and viral hepatitis for years. Uh, so um, I think on that introduction note, I, I really look forward to uh, hear the panel's discussion. But I think before we do that, I, I would want to give each of the panel members a chance to just uh, briefly introduce yourself uh, to the audience uh, um, before we go. Uh, uh, we have um, a series of questions for you to respond to. So if I can call on uh, Vladimir uh, Sh uh, Shulanov, uh, if you could briefly introduce yourself, if you don't mind. Yeah, thanks, James. Uh, <clears throat> I'm Vladimir Shulanov. I'm uh, Deputy Head of uh, for Science and Innovation in the National Medical Research Center for Tumor and Infectious Diseases. Um, uh, for many years, I used to be the head of uh, the reference center for viral hepatitis, uh, and uh, this is uh, the focus of my um, uh, research, let's say. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> at the moment, uh, my responsibilities are a little bit broader. Um, uh, uh, I am uh, responsible for um, infectious diseases uh, uh, in general uh, for uh, surveillance and uh, development of uh, national uh, guidelines for uh, treatment care for patients with infectious diseases. So at the moment I uh, deeply involved in the COVID problem, but still viral hepatitis is uh, my favorite area of uh, interest, so. Thank you, Vladimir. Appreciate it. Uh, Vladimir, if you have a, um, a microphone that's closer to your mouth, that would be great. It's a little bit difficult to hear some of what you're saying when we come back to you. So the next one up uh, uh, is uh, Nicole uh, Sekai at, at WHO Regional Office for Europe. Uh, uh, Nicole, please. Hi everyone, uh, it's really a pleasure to be here in the in this very interesting meeting today. So I'm Nicole Segui, I'm the um, team lead for HIV, STI and viral hepatitis in the WHO Regional Office for Europe. I've been uh, in Europe for the last two years. Previously I was in uh, Cambodia, I started with WHO in Cambodia, then China and India. So I've been in large countries. Uh, and I'm um, very interested in uh, implementation science in general. And I think we can really use better uh, research and particularly operational research in the region to inform uh, policy change and uh, reaching the target. So very happy to be in the panel today. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. That's wonderful. So my good friend, Eugenie Voronin, please. Um, maybe not a long introduction. Everybody knows you, Eugenie, uh, but please. <laughs> hi, Jean. I'm very happy to see all of you. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Evgeny Voronin. I'm head of Russian AIDS Pediatric Center. I'm involved uh, uh, in the care of our children and prevention mother to child transmission more than uh, 30 years. Uh, it's uh, uh, very difficult to overestimate the role of uh, international cooperation. During the uh, last 10 years, we have very closely worked uh, with uh, Cooperate with Pediatric European Network for Treatment of AIDS, um, and also very closely work with the uh, HIV team of WHO. Uh, I'm happy to see Nicole here, head of this team. Uh, I would like to discuss with you uh, some of the actual problems of uh, HIV-infected children in Russia. Now, in our country, registered 10,000 uh, children living with HIV. More than 50 of them live in 11% of region of our country. 
approximately uh, now near 99 percent of uh, children uh, follow up by the eight centers. Uh, 98 percent of uh, them receive antiviral therapy and uh, 90 percent have uh, who receive uh, antiviral therapy have undetermined viral load. This is a good result, but it's not a reason for complacency uh, because uh, all the time uh, increase the proportion of uh, adolescents with HIV and with HIV the children. Uh, for example, uh, five years ago, adolescents consisted only 30% uh, among the children with HIV. Now, already 50%. And in three years, proportion of adolescents will be more than 70% among the uh, HIV children in Russia. I focus all your attention on this question because adolescents are most valuable group concerning adherence, neurological complication, psychosocial problems, because near 40% of uh, adolescents with HIV live um, uh, in foster families and other problems. I think it will be very important to have strong cooperation in the support of adolescents with HIV in different aspects, uh, treatment of HIV, prevention of resistance, uh, improve of adherence, psychosocial problems, mental health, and so on. It, it will be very useful to make use the best uh, international experience, best international practice. Thank you. Uh, I think we lost you here, Varunin. Uh, so, um, sorry, uh, it seems like your microphone went on mute. So, but thank you for emphasizing uh, your long standing interest in uh, pediatric HIV. Uh, and I'm sure that aspect, uh, which haven't really been covered today, uh, but I appreciate uh, your your dedication to that area and why you wanted to emphasize it uh, also in the in this presentation round. Uh, so I think in the interest of time, we'll just understand that Sylvia is not able to join. Uh, correct, Francesca? Uh, correct. So, yes, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. So so we'll go on to Georgie uh, Basikin. Uh, briefly, if you could introduce yourself, please. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me here. Um, uh, I come from uh, the evolutionary side, more than ever, and anything else, and I've been involved in uh, genetic technology of uh, some infectious diseases, uh, um, influenza, uh, COVID, obviously, and recently, but uh, also uh, we have had a project on a very dense sequencing of one region uh, in uh, each uh, of HIV samples from one particular region of Russia over the next uh, couple of years, trying to, you know, to. Uh, apply many of the powerful tools that we have in genomic epidemiology for uh, for visual tangling and different transmissions for figuring out the, for the, the forces that contribute to the spread um, and so forth. So that's one thing I've been doing recently. Oh, I, I forgot to say I'm, I'm a professor in the whole community of science and technology. Thank you. Thank you, Georgie. Appreciate that introduction. Um, so we have met a uh, session already, but maybe just, just to make sure that everybody have heard you, the session. Uh, and uh, and Georgie, if you could mute your phone. Thank you. So, uh, Sasha, please just briefly. Yeah, we have... we may not have Sasha on, on the line from University he, of Edinburgh. He wrote that he had um, connection problems. He will try I to see. join later. Okay. Finally, I'm very happy to introduce uh, Tula uh, Vasakari. Uh, uh, so, Tula, please, uh, if you could Thank introduce you. yourself. Thank you. Good afternoon to everybody. I'm Tula Vasakari, and as you heard, it starts my first name starts with TU, which means for tuberculosis. Probably the tuberculosis have chosen me, but I'm a head of Finnish Lung Health Association and working as a part time professor in Turku University. And at my 
research field is more or less in TB and in epidemiology of, of other respiratory diseases as well. And, and I followed the morning session about TB, don't know so much about HIV and, and other infections or do know too few about them. But, but here, I guess I'm representing the Nordic Dimension Partnership in public health and social well-being and, and one expert group of that dealing with HIV, TB and associated infections. But, but my work for more or less as a clinician for something like 20, 20 years has been in respiratory fields and especially TB, but, but research is also TB and some other items. I'm so happy to be here and so, so nice to be here. Thank you. That's great, uh, Trula. Thank you very much, and thank you for for being here. Uh, so, uh, and share your perspective. Um, so, on that note, uh, Vadim, um, I, I guess at least for me, the first questions to the panel that I would like to have a quick round on is: uh, You heard the presentation earlier today. Um, how? What is your reflection on this being helpful, not only for the again the concrete research project, but also uh, for enhancing uh, scientific cooperation, uh, and and whether that is useful? Uh, if you have some generic remarks around that, uh, and maybe Vadim, if you want to start on that, uh, I just want uh, some remarks. Maybe we need to structure our discussion. Maybe we looked for etiology, for instance, so we start with HIV, then hepatitis C, and uh, so on. Maybe it would be uh, better for discussions than discussion in, on in general terms. What do you think? Uh, I take your lead on this, madam. Please go ahead. Uh, so let's start with HIV, as it, it is mentioned in our program. So what uh, position uh, at the moment we uh, are looking at as the, the main? Uh, for me, uh, the main problem is resistance, which is increasing in our region. And of course, uh, uh, the coverage of treatment is not the scientific idea. It's more dependent on economy or some, some maybe a social problem. But uh, in any case, uh, from scientific, scientific point of view, the increasing in resistance, for instance, in Eastern Europe, I don't think it's so rapid in Western or Central uh, Europe. But I guess that uh, uh, surveillance and uh, mm, some struggle against uh, uh, resistance uh, of HIV to antiretrovirals. I guess it's uh, <clears throat> the most interesting scientific points. Of course, <laughs> I don't uh, speak today about the uh, cure of HIV infection. Maybe it's a special issue, but probably not for this particular meeting. So I think we can start with uh, problem of uh, uh, resistance, surveillance on resistance, um, uh, and uh, how to prevent further increasing of this danger. Maybe somebody wants to uh, say something about this on HIV first. Igor, I guess you want to say. I think the call has been turned off. Igor, you want to speak first? Or? No, you go ahead. I think you already have it. You can go. You can go. Okay, so on the HIV um, topics and the drug resistance, because Sylvia is not here, I can feel for her. I think. Uh, we have data and we've seen very good presentation on drug resistance profile of, uh, of some regimens and drugs, um, which is very good. What we also need to do is strengthen the surveillance at the population level. And uh, there are WHO special surveys and uh, standard um, protocols for that. And it would be good if we could uh, 
strengthens this um, this population level drug resistance surveys in in the different countries of the region and also if we could start uh, reporting to the WHO HIV re drug resistance database we, we can speak more about that um, the drug resistant profile of the drugs used in um, in Russia in the in the first regime is very useful as Elena said because it could inform the, the guideline development groups. So toxicity and resistant levels of drugs that are not very much published internationally are very welcome. Um, so this, this cooperation between uh, the countries in, in the WHO uh, European region is very good for the countries uh, use for the regional level use, but and also for the, the global level use. So we also have another topic that is of uh, very high importance at the moment from which in the region and particularly in Russia, um, you have big numbers and you can contribute is the co-infection uh, management and patient outcome. One example is the co-infection management of uh, HIV and HCV patient and uh, HCV patient and MDR-TB patients. So using the, the new oral MDR treatment regimen with direct acting antivirals and what is the patient outcome. So this is very important to be able to uh, recommend concomitant treatment um, that would possibly improve uh, uh, outcome for patients having comorbidities, MDR, TB and uh, HCV. Other topic is uh, is also HBV and uh, and uh, other co-infections, uh, and so there are a lot of topics around co-infection and patient outcomes because we know that for the moment we are very poor outcome when we come to co-infection. My last point is not only cohort and patient outcome, but also studying, uh, op giving, do, doing operational research on service delivery model. So uh, we know that with the new targets that we have, we're going to have globally for 2030 and even the bold Russia targets that we have now that are very welcome to increase the number of uh, uh, patients on treatment. Uh, for HIV, we really need to get a better understanding of what are the st service delivery models that are giving the best results. And by that, I mean it can be serv uh, health services based, patient centered, using more integrated services or more linked services to give better people centered approach for, for treating different conditions at the same time and easing patient pathways. Uh, so those are very important because we we think that if we integrate more, if we decentralize more, we will get better results in terms of the cascade of care, whether it's for HIV or uh, co-infection. So um, service delivery models, also on PrEP, um, if, if uh, some of you are working on PrEP, uh, trying to find best model for PrEP scale up for different population group, not only MSM, but uh, other population uh, group uh, as well. So I will stop here, but there is a lot of topic that we uh, collectively can uh, address and that will really inform the, um, the policy changes and the service delivery approach that would give better results and uh, enable to reach the target. Thank you. Thank you. A long wish list, uh, Nicole. That's always good. Uh, so I guess I'll come back to you at some point and say how are we going to fund that? Uh, because uh, I think that's what we are struggling with. Uh, it's not the, the number of research questions, uh, but it's how to actually get them uh, going. Uh, so um, but I guess that's a discussion to come back to. Um, uh, anybody else who wants to add to the point about HIV, what are the big outstanding issues? That seems to be the, the topic we are discussing now. Marina, please. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, in the frame of the care project, we had the special task to develop that uh, strategic um, plan for monitoring of HIV drug resistance in Russia. And we did it. So for the moment, we have the strategic plan, which is um, intended for the monitoring of 
uh, drug resistance and patients initiating HIV uh, treatment. But I think we need to expand this um, plan for the patients who failed on uh, uh, AIT because we have a lot of them and we have some information on the mutations profile in these patients. And I think that this kind of monitoring is needed in Russia. So I think for this moment, we need to, um, to find the medical authorities who are interested in implementing this strategic plan. So I think it will be the next step in our work. As to the HIV resistance work in our laboratory, I am very pleased to say that we introduced NGS method in our um, routine practice. And I think that we will use it in the future because it gives us more information about the uh, dominating genetic virus and we need this information very much. So it looks like we climbed some steps up during the project and I think we should stay at this level for the future, in the future. Thank you. Good points, Marina. Um, good to hear, and I agree with you that there is a method established here for surveillance. Uh, so now it's a question of, of, of scaling that, uh, because uh, you know what you have to do, uh, and you know the technology of doing it. Uh, so now it's just a quantity issue. Um, understand, uh, uh, Georgie, you have a comment on this? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Oh, yes. Sorry about the problems. Yeah, I, I just wanted to uh, support what uh, Nicole said and Marina uh, said about the importance of surveillance. And in particular, in the context of drug resistance, the, uh, the and yes, uh, the, the whole genome sequencing is uh, really important because it, among other things, allows uh, you to distinguish the new mutations from uh, that acquired uh, from the population. And uh, I'm talking about the resistance mutations here. So that is one, one of the aspects, uh, aspects of the drug resistance um, spread that is, that is important. Just a brief comment. Thank you, Yego. So, um, Eugenie, I mean, uh, you, are, you, are, you, you presented uh, your concerns about pediatric HIV. You want to expand on what you see are the pressing research questions from, uh, from that aspect of HIV care. You mentioned uh, children, but you also mentioned adolescents in your introduction comments. You want to expand on that? You need to unmute your microphone. Sure, thank you. Thank you for uh, your attention to your, to your questions. First of all, concern pediatric uh, treatment we need in the uh, modern, me modern medicines because uh, we, uh, our young children suffer, suffer uh, from the uh, very restricted number of uh, medicines, you know. And so, of course, if we have resistant, we have very restricted choice of, uh, for the change of medicines. And of course, uh, we have uh, more, uh, mm, a more modern uh, medicines for treatment of children. Because now, now for example, near 40 of children uh, use the caletra. Uh, you know that we use caletra near 20 years. So from one point we receive, uh, uh, we have uh, a lot of success concerning the treatment of children uh, with HIV, but of course we uh, need in the new research uh, in very close co cooperation with the double show with another international organizations. Thank you for that perspective. So, Valen, uh, if I can ask you, I mean, you are responsible for surveillance in, in Russia. Um, and it's true that HIV resistance is a, a is a is a challenge. You heard that there is actually at least methodologies to uh, to do surveillance, uh, uh, and it's I guess it's a question of how to scale that. But uh, but why why is 
HIV resistant such a problem in Eastern Europe? And would there be a uh, an interest to actually examine that in more detail? Uh, uh, so we, rather than understanding that there's a problem, try to understand how to fix it. If I can, I can say it that way. Madam, you want to come into that? Have we lost him? Madam Potovsky, are you there? I'm afraid uh, uh, we lost him. Yeah. I see. The connection. Okay. okay. Anybody else who wants to give a perspective on that? Why is it so such a dominant issue? Because I agree it is. Uh, and I think there's a lot of data to suggest that it is. And uh, and how, how would we structure a research program to actually get to an understanding of, of what are the main drivers uh, and so we can identify them and hopefully manage them in a better way so we reduce the chance of uh, resistance. Marina, you have your hand up. Was that an old hand or is that the comment to this? I, I would just like to say some words about our recent study devoted to the early warning indicators in Russia. We collected the data from some regions and found that there are no regions where all indicators are good. So we can see that uh, in most regions in Russia there are some um, situations which may help uh, to formation of HIV drug resistance. So we, we need to, to start with this study because it, it, it is not expensive. It is very easy to, to do it, but it is, um, it, it is possible to find uh, the most touchable region, uh, regions in Russia and the most touchable problems. So I think we may start with these studies all over Russia, in all Russian regions. I think the most um, important problems for drug resistant formations are uh, non adherence drug stockouts and very, very easy things that we all know can provoke the drug resistance formation. That's all. Thank you. Well, if it is that simple, Marina, uh, that may be an area because it, it uh, has been expressed as a major public health concern that really needs to be targeted also in, in relationship to um, to strategies and visions for scaling up antiviral treatment uh, that if, if you scale up uh, with good intention of treatment uh, but at the same time uh, is not uh, really identifying those sort of fairly obvious uh, risk factors for resistance you're just going to scale up the, the the public health impact from resistance uh, as you scale up treatment uh, because we know it's treatment who's inducing resistance uh, right uh, is that a two? So, Elena, please. Yes, thank you, uh, Jans. Um, I'm Elena Vovka. I work at WHO European um, uh, Office for Copen in Copenhagen uh, with Nicole and Nicole's team. Um, I'm sorry I was not supposed to, to, to make an intrusion into the panel discussions, uh, and I'm definitely sure that the team for Russia with uh, Professor Pukowski is the best to speak about the multi-country study, which Marina, um, Dr. Bobova also mentioned. Um, there is a study running in uh, at least six Eastern European countries, and that included also a survey uh, of early warning indicators, some kind of public health approach that we're trying to recommend to countries to, um, as a part of the HIV drug resistance surveillance so that they use the minimum of data uh, of seven indicators, including the viral load, uh, regularity of uh, treatment monitoring approaches with viral load and CD4 counts to see where they can tackle better and prevent better the, the development of the drug resistance. What I wanted to say is that uh, definitely multiple regimens uh, frequent change because of the new ARVs and different changes in the policy generated by certain availability of drugs, of, of new antiretrovirals. Uh, that is one of the uh, factors that influenced uh, the development of drug resistance. And uh, definitely 
what we hear is a lot of problems with adherence because uh, all the countries in Eastern Europe, they, they struggle with the same thing. Maybe that is a clinical issue. And uh, I remember Jens uh, uh, talking to the clinicians from Eastern Europe, always saying that you need to spend more time simply with the patients to explain adherence. So clinicians, either they have to do more work or there, there, are need, there is a need of more tools to monitor adherence because this is something that is missing in Eastern European countries and maybe not done in, uh, as in the West. However, what we would like from WHO to reiterate is that it's very important that countries understand they need to have an approach of HIV drug resistance surveillance at national level so that they understand national levels. Because in countries with big epidemics, the approach is more of a public health approach. Once in two or three years to conduct this national representative survey and understand what we have. Uh, in the Western Europe, uh, there are less people with HIV and you have more potential to test for drug resistance. So the approach is different and it can be very costly for the Eastern Europe. So there are two different approaches, as, as I mentioned in the um, in the morning session, it would be very nice if this project embark on a better cooperation to also help us identify a certain strategy to monitor drug resistance, like considering the diversity of the countries. Over. Well, thank you for that perspective. That was important. I agree. Um, <clears throat> okay. Um, so, uh, ah, we, I see how we have had him back. Good to see you again, Madam. We have just had a long discussion about HIV resistance because you, you, you started having that discussion. I, I think we have a solution. Uh, so I'll debrief you after the call. So, uh, um, but in the interest of time, maybe we should move on uh, to also discuss. Uh, Madam, you want to say something? You you need to put your microphone. Uh, you need to unmute your microphone. Just just one point. We need. Uh the unique uh, methodology this is very important if uh, there will be a good idea for to get uh, comparable data we need unique methodology it's very important so we need probably to produce something uh, for uh, such uh, document that that's only my remark okay but uh, again, I think you need to talk to Marina because I think she has the unique technology there. So, uh, uh, and therefore it, it is possible to do. Uh, so there's been a lot of work being invested in, in actually doing that. So um, so Marina Popkova would be um, a good person to talk about in relation to that. Okay. <clears throat> I mean, it, uh, I know this is a, a difficult discussion because there's so many topics on the table, uh, but uh, I mean, if, if, if we can try to move a little bit away from HIV and also touch uh, on TB, which is um, obviously a, a major uh, public health issue as well. And uh, you heard about some of the work done uh, in terms of developing new uh, uh, methods and technologies for early diagnosis uh, of TB uh, as one aspect and also you heard about uh, some of the projects relating to uh, identifying uh, in a comprehensive way resistance um, and drug susceptibility um, as that obviously is also a major uh, hurdle. Um, so Vadim, your key question in relation to TB, what do you think um, are the key questions for my country? It's uh, especially in connection with HIV infection because we have a lot of uh, new um, uh, resistance strain of uh, mycobacteria uh, and in in HIV patients. So the, at the moment, the HIV infection mixed to be HIV is the main problem. There are a great redu reduction in uh, the case of uh, uh, TB not connected to this HIV infection and an increase in the number of TB cases, um, comorbidity uh, in, in, um, in uh, 
company of this HIV. <laughs> so the, this is uh, the problem and the type of this uh, uh, mycobacteria is differ from those which are uh, spreading in general population. I think it's the most uh, interesting and the most important issue at the moment. So it's necessary to discuss, especially maybe it's not a problem for Western Europe, but for Russia, uh, our uh, success in the struggle with TB is not so good because of HIV spreading. So that that's uh, the most uh, difficult uh, uh, problem on TB now. So you're describing a, a what can I say, a, a diversified epidemic of TB where it, it continues to be reduced in the general so, population, but actually you see the opposite in HIV populations. I Probably, guess it's different uh, epidemic with different strains of uh, yeah. mycobacteria. Uh, and also there's an accumulation of uh, drug resistant and multi-drug resistant TB in the HIV yeah. population. Um, so that, on that aspect, um, anybody who wants to add uh, to that perspective, uh, is that the key issue in terms of TB? Um, um, we obviously is trying in care to address that uh, specifically, uh, as mentioned. Uh, is there other, other aspects uh, that people want to raise in, in relation to TB? Nicole, please. Yeah, maybe I'm going to say the same thing, but what we notice in the region, not specifically in Russia, but as, uh, as, a, uh, as a region, is that the, for co-infected patient, uh, HIV and TB, the TB treatment outcome are much poorer in our region than globally. So we have much more death. Uh, in, from, from you know, so um, we need to understand the reason, and we need to address that. Whether it's uh, a tr the way treatment is uh, organized for those disease or service delivery model, but this is in our region we are doing poorer than in other regions for infected patients. No, thank you, Nicole. I think that's well established. It's also well documented in the literature. Uh, and the question, I, I think, comes down to whether it's because of uh, of the more prominent uh, dissemination of drug-resistant TB, that is, uh, and lack of uh, of a sufficient number of drugs to treat it with. as an explanation of whether it's others. I can see Matthias has raised his hand, and and Tula after that. So Matthias, please. And just one comment. So we have a, a little bit of a different angle. We are mostly interested in drug-resistant TB. So. We cannot really comment if in an HIV population you have more drug resistances or not. Um, but what we see in general is that the drug resistant bacterial populations are, are increasing in, in, in all sites actually across uh, Eastern Europe and also from Russia. We, we have reports about that. Um, what is interesting to mention maybe is that we always see our our known, our usual suspects. So there are just a few um, distinct strain types which we can find in all settings. So they have also acquired quite a large uh, or diverse set of resistance mutation already. So we have to deal a lot of with pre-existing drug resistances, which was also problematic here in our care cohort that when we go with new treatment approaches, like when we include, for instance, bedaquiline as a new drug, um, we have to, yeah, we have to consider these pre-existing drug resistances, and um, also the fact that for many resistances we don't really have good phenotypic tests, and or nor we don't have really the, the knowledge about the molecular resistance determinants. So, and that was also very, yeah. Uh, beneficial, I think, to that we have these cohorts here from St. Petersburg and um, Moldova, which are really the hotspot regions in the world, and that we could have a glimpse on the genetic setup of these strains and uh, get some, some insights into that. No, thank you, Matthias. I think that this really speaks to some of the concerns that Nicole was raising, uh, that we still don't have a perfect uh, sort of way to interpret drug resistance uh, 
uh, in cases of, of, of strains where there is not 100% uh, susceptible susceptibility to the standard treatment. So I think that's an important perspective. So Tula and then uh, Jan after that, please. Yeah. Thank you. The research you've been doing or the, the cohort you were collecting, I just admire that. That's, that's just great. For double, the whole genome sequencing, it's not for every place anyway. And, and in WHO Europe region, there are probably different kinds of reasons for poor outcomes. And for, for low incidence countries like ours, it's probably that the patients are so old and they have so many other diseases. The resistance is luckily, but, but I'm talking about from a country that we have only 250 cases of TB and a couple of cases of MDR per year and, and just keep it that, that in mind when I'm, I'm talking. But anyway, there are different kinds of reasons, but, but for long having that DOT and, and now from the kind of we should put more interest on patient-centered care because DOT sounds too restricted, but, but having the possibility for bio, video surveillance for many countries, it would make it easier because ev every one of us can, can fully understand that having at least half a year of medication, which probably makes you at least feeling not that good all the time for sensitive TB and, and for 20 months or or something like that for drug resistance. So we urgently need more drugs and, and the number of more than 15% of drug resistance for pedagiline in Moldova, it's kind of shocked me in the in the morning. But but anyway, there are so many things to be challenged and done, but, but having a good way of diagnosis, meaning doing more with the genome sequencing and getting it everywhere, that would be nice. And that, then we should have medication every place and, and and we as doctors we could be able to prescribe the medication needed and kind of give strength to our patients to cope with the medication but there, there are so many things so many interesting things but but it's great having research as a way of collaboration or implementing research that that's just that all the day have sounded so nice so so great job you are doing Thank you, Tula. I mean, uh, thank you for also supporting that we have established cooperation. I think we're addressing exactly those issues. Um, I can see Jan uh, and then Francis and then Nicole. Jan, please. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I totally agree with uh, Tula's and Matthias' uh, perspective. I can maybe add a little bit from um, the, the doctor's perspective again then. I think um, that we are repeating certain uh, errors that we have com committed in, in the past, now also with the novel drug Bedaculin, but maybe also with other drugs that we may um, uh, have in the near future, because there are some novel drugs that may be introduced to the market, or at least a uh, novel drug a combination. And I think um, that we in, in CARE now just showed that um, just giving patients um, uh, novel drugs and uh, trusting that that will solve our problem for uh, eternity is just not true. So we, we, we need to be a bit more, uh, we, we need to be smarter in the future by uh, exactly knowing which drugs can be given to our patients. That is just so important. And as Tula pointed out, we, we already saw that now in a relatively uh, bedaculin naive uh, uh, cohort um, that there is already uh, bedaculin drug resistance and we will now see an evolution uh, where we, we will not only have uh, limited cases of bedaculin drug resistance but uh, more and more and when we have or if we have a commercially available um, molecular tests that tell us that inform us that this is present in the correspondence uh, strains then we will certainly wake up and say, okay, we need to start up again and, and um, uh, treat in individual, individualized uh, manners and not in a standard for all uh, approach. So that, that is very important, I think. And, and that is something where our care consortium already contributed, which I think is, uh, is uh, great already. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, I couldn't agree more, Jan, with that point. I mean, uh, not... <laughs> In, in, in HIV, we always have been concerned about the concept of, of burning the drugs by giving functional monotherapy. Uh, um, and I think that's the point you are making, but also for TB, that if you just give functional monotherapy, so that you may give four or five drugs, but 
most of them is not working, you are giving functional monotherapy and that will lead to selection against resistance as well for that one that is remaining. And then you have done really no good uh, in the end of the day. So, and to, to be smart around that, I think is uh, really important uh, and get new technologies, uh, whole genome sequencing is probably the solution if you can get the price down. Uh, so Francis, you have a, your hand up, please. Yes, thanks very much. Um, adding really to what Jan and, and Tula have said, I mean, I've been working with Russian colleagues in the TB service for, for over you know, 20 years um, and with WHO colleagues. And there are a number of issues that, that have, um, I think, that have changed for the better, uh, which I think are, are, are clear. Um, the surveillance systems are better. Um, which has helped so that we know, it, you know what is actually happening. But going back quite a long time, we've had very high rates of multi-drug resistant tuberculosis in Russia and, and in other countries in the former uh, Soviet Union states. And Russia and other countries have certainly reduced the number of, of overall TB cases. Um, but we still, I think, lack really good um, rapid diagnosis that can identify the patient population in the in in the next you know hour, the drug resistant population that is. We've started to introduce it. Russia has has certainly introduced those those measures. Um, but in the past, um, you mentioned functional uh, monotherapy. There were issues about drug supply, the quality of drugs, the um, the actual doses of drugs. Um, it's it's a it's you know the, the the dose of rifampicin that we are supposed to give is ten milligrams per kilogram. And yet somebody of my size, and I'm not 60 kilograms, I can tell you, would still be given 600. So we often, you know, underdose um, by, by default. And then probably the thing that's the, that has changed to some extent is the issue of infection control. And traditionally that has not been very good. And I think that has been a way of bringing TB into the HIV centers, et cetera. Um, but there have been some very successful programs. And, and my colleague, uh, Andre, I think he's on, online, and in, in our Hangels is, is a good example of that. So it is possible to reverse or, or at least address some of those uh, problems quite successfully. And there are good examples of that in Russia uh, and indeed elsewhere uh, in, in Eastern Europe. No, thank you, Francis. I think that's an extraordinary important perspective as well, uh, that we need to understand uh, the, the good examples. Um, where things, despite all the challenges, it has been possible to revert. And I agree with you, there's many of those good examples, but let, let, let's let make sure that they are well documented and learned from uh, so as inspiration uh, for others. Uh, Andre, you had a comment. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Jans, for the possibility to say something I uh, made. Uh, 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 remarks about the uh, reason of why we have uh, many uh, MDI-TB, XDI-TB cases uh, among the HIV-positive uh, cases. Uh, I think it's the main reason, it's not reason in the genetics. Uh, we try to understand they really joined with a different type of mycobacteria. And uh, and we found that the main reason uh, it's really like what uh, Francis said it's a good uh, TB program in the region, good uh, HIV program in the region. In my region, we have only eight percent of the HIV positive cases among the uh, new tuberculosis cases uh, because uh, we we have not the special uh, special. Uh, inpatient department, like in many other regions, was established. Now it's uh, close. Uh, try to close uh, some region because nosocomial infection. It's uh, main for my view. Nosocomial infection is the main uh, problem for distribution MDI XDI to be in uh, uh, Eastern uh, European countries uh, because uh, a long tradition to keep the, the patient to treat the patient in the inpatient department. It's not good uh, practical, and uh, it's very simple to distribute the uh, uh, resistant strains among the many patients, especially vulnerable groups, uh, HIV positive vulnerable groups. And when we collect in one place, it's very simple to distribute it, uh, distribute it uh, drug resistant, and especially this patient continue to uh, get the special uh, contact and vulnerable groups. Uh, continue to meet in the other places. 
out uh, of the inpatient department. It's very simple to distribute it, uh, distribute it, uh, uh, MDITB cases. I think it's the main reason for not good uh, profile uh, resistance of the uh, mycobacteria, typically among the HIV positive uh, cases, but it's not uh, joined with a uh, genetics mutation. It's uh, uh, any genetic types of mycobacteria, I think it's. And of course, uh, if you we have a good uh, HIV uh, program, it's the influence of the uh, good uh, situation, uh, better situation in uh, tuberculosis resistant in this region too. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Tula, you had a, a brief comment as well. Yeah, thank you, thank you. You've been doing just a wonderful job there, Andre, and there are many good examples in Russia and it would be very nice to be documented and also kind of shared with the research community and published. <laughs> so so that's great that you have been doing that. But, but for the inpatient treatment, I fully understand the difficulty of changing the situation to outpatient treatment course. It's also a question of jobs for healthcare professionals and all that. I've been working with Baltic countries in that issue and it's, it's kind of hard because it, it, it needs a big change changing from the inpatient treatment to outpatient treatment or at least starting in hospital but trying to shift it as soon as possible to outpatients not to spread the disease but but then there should be so strict infection control for so those going back home not to spreading the disease so there are so many difficulties but but i fully understand because some decades ago in Finland, it was anyway so that that it was kind of for healthcare professionals could to hold the patient in hospital because it was our salary at that time point four decades ago. So I fully understand also that, and it's it needs also change in the kind of the level of treatment of anyway the treatment based on hospital and in outpatient treatment. But, but thank you. It's not continuing longer, taking not too much time. Thank you. Okay, so it seems like, Andre, you have already written a chapter for Francis' book on the best practice uh, of handling uh, communities with um, uh, widespread uh, drug-resistant uh, TB. Um, if I can just remind everybody, as, as you know, uh, in, in clinical care, we always need to not forget about the simple things. And uh, we obviously know that the most preventive, most effective preventive intervention for multidrug resistant TB in HIV patients is obviously putting them on antiviral treatment. I mean, uh, it has around 80 to 90% chance of being successful. Um, and it works irrespective of whether TB is fully drug susceptible or whether it's uh, multidrug resistant, uh, right? So we know that the risk of uh, contracting active TB uh, per year um, is um, around 10% if you are untreated HIV. Uh, and it uh, is much, much smaller if you are on fully effective antiviral treatment. So, uh, so uh, we should never forget the simple things as well. Um, and that may be a driver, I'm wondering, coming back to you, Vadim, uh, may be a driver for why you see a lot of, um, of drug-resistant TB among HIV patients, uh, uh, that uh, TB have a, um, a fairly good chance to develop into clinical disease because of uh, not everybody gets on antiviral treatment, I wonder. Uh, there is a uh, uh, suggestion that uh, uh, those uh, TB bacteria, which are affected uh, HIV patients, they are uh, uh, not not so strong. They are resistant, but their fitness is weaker than regular uh, TB bacteria. Um, so they cannot uh, infect. Uh, healthy person, but enough strong to infect HIV immunocompromised person. So this, this is one of uh, uh, ideas which are under discussion in discussion now in our country. So that, 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 that that's for you, just for your uh, for your uh, information. So that I'm not sure that it, it's true also. But uh, but it is now discussed in our okay. government. Fair enough. Uh, 
always good to express hypotheses, although this one, uh, to me, sounds a little bit unlikely. It be, <laughs> yes. uh, but, uh, Nico, you have a comment to this discussion, please. No, I think I will reiterate the, the comment I made in the beginning. So uh, the service delivery models, whether people are getting late on the ART, or whether they are, uh, there is infection prevention controls gaps in the and the, the service delivery model for for treatment for TB it needs to be changed to to make it uh, easier for patients to get what they need when they need and where they need. Uh, I think that will solve. That's the basic things that uh, Jans you're talking about. Be, beside the science, this is this is not very scientific, but this is the, the this is the truth. This is if you don't get the services that you need when you need and where you need, then it's everything is delayed and 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 so that's where I insist on, and that's the most difficult part because in the Eastern Europe the services are very verticalized, and to make those changes is extremely complicated. You need to you need to shake the the health system, but I think until and unless we start doing some changes, maybe not everything at the same time, but some of the changes, like uh, outpatient treatment, etc then uh, we will get better outcome for patients. So that, that's my point. Beside the, you know, the, all the, the uh, raw science, we have service delivery issues that needs to be solved to make progress. Well, good point. I mean, uh, but again, uh, uh, Andra, uh, as you, can, you just heard, uh, actually have been working on implementation uh, research as well, uh, and I have, has been good at it. I was actually wanted to introduce uh, Nika from Georgia, because I can see you have your hand, hand raised. Uh, Nika, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so I just really want to echo this, uh, <clears throat> your point about starting ART time. So I think that when we see the TBHIV co-infection cases, so we see the, mostly we see the patients who have been diagnosed with low, very low CD4 cell counts. So they are usually late presenters. And quite often they are injection drug users. Uh, sometimes they have the history of imprisonment. So I think that there is kind of intersection of late diagnosis being injection drug users being sometimes imprisoned in recent period. So I think that the point of reducing the, the um, uh, reducing the number of co-infections in HIV patients with, really relates to the, our effectiveness in, in terms of reaching HIV patients timely at the, uh, early as the course of the HIV infections. So reaching IDUs with the prevention interventions, with the harm reduction, also engaging them, HIV testing, TB testing, hepatitis testings, which also enters the uh, possibilities to uh, timely diagnose all, diagnose all the diseases. So unless we are able to uh, to reduce the, the rates of late diagnosis in our countries. I think it's going to be really very difficult to uh, reduce the, the number of infections. So, for example, in Georgia, um, we have more than half of the neurodiagnosed patients presenting with a CD4 cell count less than 350, and the one thirds are presenting usually with advanced disease. So, I think that if you are not in, in stable for, uh, for over 10 years or even more periods, so I think if you are not able to reduce this, and if you aren't able to reach more IDUs for the prevention and then testing services, so I think the TBHIV would remain the significant problem yeah, in Georgia and, and, and elsewhere in the region. Thank you. Well, thank you, Nika. And I'm, I'm glad you're speaking about HIV testing as an integral part of dealing with this. Uh, so one, and I guess that's also, Nicole, your point about service delivery. It's not only how to treat people once they arrive with disease, but also make sure you have a comprehensive testing program in place uh, in order to really uh, identify people. I mean, HIV, it's, you know, in, in COVID-19, we have the window opportunity of treating people before they get very sick of around five days, right? Uh, for HIV, we have uh, five years uh, of, as window opportunity before people get to advanced disease stages. Uh, so if we have an effective um, testing program um, and then a good transition for those identified positive, uh, that is transition into comprehensive care, um, I agree with you, uh, Nika. Uh, a lot will be um, reduced in terms of the public health impact uh, that we're currently seeing. Andrei, uh, I can see you had a comment on this. 
Uh, we need to move on to viral hepatitis just to say this will be the concluding remarks. Uh, Andrew, and then to and then we'll move on. Andrew, please. One uh, one uh, remark of the, concerning the uh, position that uh, said Valentin uh, Vadim Valentinovich uh, concerning the uh, fitness of uh, mycobacterium and immunocompromised uh, patient uh, HIV. Uh, unfortunately, now seventy percent of the uh, type uh, genotype of mycobacterium tuberculosis is the uh, Bayesian genotype. It's very aggressive. Uh, uh, type of mycobacteria, and uh, uh, and uh, we did not find any uh, any uh, discrepancy between the uh, sensitive and uh, MDRTB uh, type uh, Bayesian families. It's the same fitness, it's the same aggressive, like in uh, like in sensitive uh, mycobacteria. But of course, we remember the previous uh, years, the 20 years when really after the uh, Increasing the uh, application of the uh, new drug resistant mycobacteria to loss of the fitness. Now it's uh, it's the same fitness uh, lost uh, uh, increase the resistant, but the same uh, fitness of mycobacteria. It's a short comment. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Andrei. That's were helpful. Tula, you had another comment before we move yeah, on. Yeah, very shortly for COVID. Briefly. Five, five days and for, for HIV it's years and for TB it's also years and, and if we can find the latent infection but there's the difficulty that we don't know with eye crust that whether it's, it's sensitive or if we know the case or the source we can know whether we should need MDR treatment for the latent or, or some drugs but, but that's just, just to remind. Thank you. No, but that's a good point. And I mean, the whole question about treating latent TB, right? Uh, that I think, uh, although it's obviously been extensively discussed uh, whether how, how solid that will be in the future of treating latent TB as opposed to handling people with active TB, I think is still a sort of strategic discussion, discussion isn't it, on, 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 on how much, um, because I mean, the number of latent TB cases is obviously <laughs> exponentially much, much larger than the number of active cases. So. All right. Uh, thank you very much. This was an interesting discussion. Vadim, I, I hope uh, coming back to you uh, uh, that um, I, I thought this was a rounded discussion around uh, what you were focusing on. And um, I think there is some important tracks and learning points, uh, but also some interesting and important science that needs to be done uh, to further uh, handle uh, that aspect uh, of what we were talking about. Any reflections on you before we go move on to viral hepatitis, Vadim? Any comments from you, Vadim, before we move on? Um, you mean next step or? No, no, I was just giving you a chance to uh, round up that discussion on TB. Uh, uh, yes, still, still, to be, uh, still we have to be pandemic. And of course, it's uh, partly uh, connected to the sour region, and uh, not not the same situation in different uh, different uh, countries. So there is uh, very uh, different uh, approaches, and uh, but we need pay attention for mainly for scientific uh, points of the problem. So what, what we really need to walk, what the direction is the most uh, interesting at the, the moment. How can we continue cooperation? What, what, what do you think? Um, I think yeah. the, the problem of resistance is very interesting. So the, the, there will be a big discussion, but it's, it is uh, a serious discussion in, in Russian uh physiatrician as we call tb specialist so that maybe uh, it is necessary to uh, hear the, their point of view also that's uh, so uh, i guess that uh, tb resistance uh, to especially to uh, present drug which we used at the moment, and how to overcome this problem. 
this, I think it would be the most interesting direction for the future. Okay. Interesting perspective. Thank you very much. Um, so, in the end here, um, we should talk about viral hepatitis. Um, I mean, uh, and I guess for the purpose, although I, I appreciate uh, we, we could also discuss hepatitis B, but uh, for uh, proportionally, hepatitis C obviously is, uh, is a dominating uh, um, disease, uh, if you would agree with that. Uh, um, but you also heard uh, during the day uh, that there is a very large and solid data to support uh, that is, uh, it's an infection that we can actually cure, and we can cure it quite quickly. Uh, eight to 12 weeks um, of treatment uh, leads to cure in, in most people. Um, so what are the residual research um, that we should focus on uh, um, and uh, I'm, I'm sure that there will be a point about implementation research to actually reach uh, that treatment for more people. Uh, um, uh, uh, so that's recognized as being important. But uh, in addition to that, are there other aspects that we should uh, work and focus on? Um, and, you know, also any uh, reflection on what the data you heard uh, of, of, of whether that was informative for the discussion would be helpful. Uh, so, at the moment, we are on very, very uh, good position that we can cure <laughs> hepatitis C, and uh, many of the countries are working on the um, uh, so-called eradication of hepatitis C. Uh, for instance, uh, when uh, today, some person asked me about how many uh, hepatitis C patients have you in your cohort of HIV infected patients. Uh, they were very disappointed when I, th I told them that uh, there is no uh, hepatitis C patient in this cohort because everybody is cured. <laughs> who had hepatitis C. So, uh, so the, uh, maybe Professor Chulanov told us about the uh, program how to uh, eradicate hepatitis C in Russia and about the great uh, funding of this uh, problem. Uh, but still, we have several cases of new infection in those who were cured previously. So reinfection of hepatitis C uh, for me is the most interesting problem and how to prevent this. It is very interesting because uh, uh, this problem probably the same as in syphilis. We can treat Syphilis very successfully, but, but still there is no eradication of syphilis at the moment. So would be the same situation with hepatitis C. This is uh, the problem at the moment. So what do you think about that? Well, I mean, that, I mean, obviously, uh, medically and biologically, uh, you're not protected against reinfection if you get re-exposed, right? So. Uh, so the, the the treatment is obviously eradicative for the individual, but uh, it's uh, once you have started to stop the treatment, if you get re-exposed, you get reinfected, or at least you have a chance of doing that. So what ca what can we do for prevention in this? Situation? No, no, but I, yeah, I think that there we come back to some of the common denominators we just talked about in terms of HIV adherence uh, and uh, changing. Um, it, it's a social uh, science discipline uh, of uh, uh, behavior modification. Um, you know, similar to, uh, uh, not as extreme, but it, it's similar to how we needed to adapt our behavior during the COVID uh, pandemic to reduce transmission. I mean, um, it, it's, it's the behavioral science uh, that needs to be involved in, in addressing that question, in my opinion. And I can see, Nicole, you had a hand up. Do you want to add to this discussion, please? 
Yeah, so I don't know how useful this is for the research, uh, the researchers, but the main problem we have with scaling up the DAAs is that the first few years we have cohort of people who know they're infected, so we have many patients. They already know their status, they're waiting for the best drugs. But after one or two years, when we have treated all this waiting list, then we have problems because countries do not have very clear screening strategies. And so we need to help uh, defining uh, who should get screen screened and uh, so cost-effective screening strategies and uh, like the US has done for certain age group, Georgia is also, I mean, depending on the prevalence in the country, we may not promote uh, testing everybody. Uh, um, but uh, so this screening strategy, we could help defining them by understanding better who is infected in each country. Uh, so that would help the scale up. So whether it's more a surveillance than a research uh, uh, issue, um, I don't know, but uh, uh, that, that's very important to address that. Second point is uh, even when people are detected, sometimes they are not very interested in getting treatment because there is more behavioral research, like you don't have symptoms and why you would get treated. Same as HIV, but it's even... Uh, less known as a, as a disease and complication, liver complication you can have from, uh, from HCV. So uh, trying to understand better, to give better communication messages on how to uh, get from diagnose to treatment and get your uh, final uh, uh, data about completion of treatment and, uh, and cure. So yeah, just food for thought, over. It's pretty remarkable, isn't it, that for a treatment that takes you eight weeks, it's difficult to get people to use it. But in HIV, we are gladly giving people lifelong treatment, uh, despite that they don't have any symptoms and they are happy about that. So so messaging <laughs> and explanation, obviously, uh, have not been very successful to explain how simple it is. I'm glad to introduce Vladimir. I'm, I'm sure you've been waiting to get in because this is your key area. So Vladimir, please. Thank you, Jens. I hope you, you can hear me better now. Uh, than, okay. So uh, in my first point, I, I, I will echo uh, Nicole uh, saying that I think that, that's um, uh, one of the most important uh, area uh, of research, uh, it's uh, operational research for uh, service del delivery models. Uh, as Vadim Valentinovich said, uh, we have very good position now in terms of prospectives of uh, elimination of viral hepatitis C in Russian Federation because we have a political will to do that. Uh, the, the government declares that uh, uh, we need to uh, decrease the new number of new cases of HCV to very low level by uh, 2030. So, uh, and uh, the, we have already some uh, movement toward that. I mean, uh, the, the um, uh, 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 research, uh, not, not research, but well, let's say uh, hepatitis council group uh, already uh, established in the Ministry of Health uh, um, of Russian Federation uh, just to plan future strategies, future uh, programs for elimination of hep C. But um, you know that the uh, hep C for uh, Russia, it's a really uh, big problem. We have a big burden of HCV, uh, approximately 2.3 million people infected, uh, I mean actively infected, not just antibody positive. And uh, of course, to, to treat such a huge number of people, we need very effective uh, models of uh, service service delivery, and I think it's it's it would be very important to focus on that. So, uh, second point, that of course surveillance. I, I think it, it, in a in broader view of of, of this term, it's uh, morbidity, mortality, uh, maybe surveillance in uh, specific groups. Uh, um, uh, we need uh, have 
better data to 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 move forward to understand uh, uh, the, the the prevalence uh, of uh, HCV um, uh, to, to understand uh, in which uh, groups uh, it's better to screen to improve screening strategies Nicole said it's, it's also important uh, uh, um, uh, area of research. Uh, also, maybe partly uh, we need to uh, focus on uh, surveillance on resistance strains. Uh, Vadim Valentinovich said that, uh, uh, well, uh, there is a problem of uh, reinfection, and sometimes this problem of reinfection could be due to. Uh, resistance strains uh, if the patients uh, uh, was not cured but experience in treatment uh, probably um, uh, transmission of this resistance strains could be a problem in the future I don't think it's a real big problem for HCV because it's cured infection but still uh, we uh, need to keep track on that. Um, uh, yeah, maybe maybe this is a, the, the most important areas uh, I, I would uh, uh, I would specify at the moment. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's truly a daunting task, uh, as you say, with uh, what is the estimation of 2.3 million people who's infected. So that's a, that's a big. <laughs> effort that needs to be taken to do that and uh, with the perspective of, uh, of of doing that by 2030 um, but it's 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 always good to have aspirational goal i suppose uh, uh, maybe i can ask uh, nick uh, from georgia because i mean you you set yourself that target a couple of years ago uh, um, maybe just to, from your end a uh, perspective on that and uh, how, how how is it progressing, and, and and do you see the chance of 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 actually coming to what I also see in the chat that Anton's making the point that the more people you are treating, uh, the less people can be the source of infection for others. Uh, are you seeing those indirect effects uh, from your treatment rollout program? So thank you. Uh, so I think that we we are making a good progress. So. Uh, uh, we set the very ambitious targets initially to be reached by 2020. That was overly ambitious. We have not reached elimination targets by 2020, but the progress is obvious. Uh, and uh, we are on a good track. Obviously, we have treated, uh, uh, we have identified around um, uh, 60 to 70% of people living with chronic hepatitis C that treated most of them, um, almost 90% of them, and we have very good treatment outcomes in this population. So we are really on target on, uh, on, on reaching the uh, the main target for elimination. We have not done uh, the direct estimation of the incidence of hepatitis C in the, in the population. We have not done the uh, direct estimation of the reinfection on the total Georgian population level, but the modeling studies indicate that, uh, that we see the uh, reduction in, in prevalence in incidence of hepatitis C as well as reduction in hepatitis C related liver related mortality. So uh, the study was modeling study was done uh, before the before the COVID pandemic and then suggested that by, that by 2025 we would have been able to uh, to reach the elimination goal of reducing the prevalence of hepatitis C by 90 percent uh, in our country and uh, reducing the incidence as well as uh, and the mortality uh, reduction is set by the WHO, 65% reduction in the mortality would have been reached a couple of years uh, after we have reached uh, uh, all other targets for um, the identification and treatment of hepatitis C patients. So COVID had really impact uh, on every aspect of uh, our activities, including in hepatitis C. Uh, so we have the reduction in hepatitis C testing, we have the reduction in hepatitis C uh, diagnosis, new diagnosis, and, and consequently enrollment in the treatment. So this all have impacted our cascade. Uh, but I guess um, um, they had an impact upon our reaching our elimination goals by 2025. But I guess uh, overall, the, the, the goal is, is, is reachable. So uh, 
by 2030, so somewhere between 2025 and 2030. Uh, what we see, what we have done in terms of uh, incidence and the reinfection, uh, we have done the reinfection study in HIV patients uh, some couple of years ago. We did the analysis of um, so the, the, of course the hepatitis C treatment is freely available for HIV HCV co-infected patients as well as, uh, as for the rest of the population in Georgia. And we have not seen the, uh, the huge reinfection rates among the uh, patients, um, among the people living with HIV. So I guess uh, it gives us kind of, um, uh, it gives us kind of hope that the overall reinfection rates uh, in the general population um, uh, are not really high. So I think that the treatment as a prevention is working for hepatitis C. Uh, but again, um, uh, I think that uh, uh, this leads us to the point that we should not be abandoning the, the pr primary prevention intervention. So especially for among injection drug users. Um, uh, so I guess <clears throat> we will need to uh, scale up our harm reduction services. Uh, Georgia is implementing needle exchange programs, methadone substitution treatments, but yet the coverage is still uh, is below the uh, recommended uh, recommended targets for the delivering the clean needle sensor and just and um, covering the people with the uh, methadone or other opioid substitution treatment program. So I get to the combination of the treatment availability along with the scaling of the primary prevention um, there would be required to, you know, to achieve the elimination goal and to in order to sustain it after the uh, after the end of the certain period. So I guess um, this will be very important. And of course the infection control practices is very important. So I guess uh, in Georgia and maybe in, in rest of the uh, Eastern European countries, in addition to the rapid uh, increase in the injection drug use in 1990s, so the, the, the collapse of public health systems in many countries of our region have also supported the spread of the hepatitis C uh, in our region, I guess, uh, implementing very good infection control practices will be also very important along with other uh, primary prevention interventions. Well, thank you, Nico. That was a very nice uh, overview, and I think it gives a perspective. Uh, I mean, like Andre was explaining for TB, uh, how to develop a best practice model and get that documented, so, which I'm sure you're doing as well. Uh, I can see, Francesca, you have a point to make, please. Yes, thank you, Jens. Well, I think it is. there is also another aspect, which is um, the correct estimate of the uh, infected population, the, 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 the part of the population which is infected but uh, is not aware of the infection. Because this uh, um, uh, uh, drives the public health response because uh, the, the, um, it's, it's active elimination and uh, uh, providing the, the DD, DAA to all the infected population is very costly. So at least in Italy, we only had uh, Tuscany that adopted this, uh, this strategy. But um, there is a, no, uh, a debate on how to model the uh, unknown uh, infected population. And maybe if there is a, an overestimate, this could drive uh, um, on, on the wrong direction, the public health response. No, thank you, uh, Francesca. I mean, again, uh, as was also discussed earlier, uh, a comprehensive testing strategy in order to reduce the number of people who is infectious but not aware of it uh, is clearly the, the, the key topic, both for HIV and for viral hepatitis. Uh, and I would argue, obviously, as well for active TB in the sense that if you're not aware that you have TB, that uh, um, <laughs> that's an issue as well in terms of uh, of you not taking the same precautions. Uh, but I guess it comes back also to Nick's point, uh, uh, Georgia, that uh, that we cannot let one one approach do it all. We need to have an umbrella of, of preventive activities uh, implemented for this to really be effective. We, we cannot rely on just one aspect and, and hope that treatment as prevention will, will sort it out because that's not going to be uh, happening anytime soon if we don't do other sort of primary prevention uh, interventions as well. Interesting. Thank you very much. Um, but in many uh, 
reflection from your end before we uh, we because uh, just to say to you that I would really want to have uh, if we can spend uh, ten or fifteen minutes uh, uh, discussing what to do now because uh, uh, as you know care is is uh, uh, is essentially ending now given the fact that we have no more funding at the moment we are struggling very hard to get. Uh, uh, a potential source of funding up and running. It hasn't been successful, at least in a comprehensive way. Uh, um, and not that I don't think I can envision that we'll stop collaborating, but it just helps to have a uh, have funders to actually give a framework for that collaboration. At least uh, that's my sense for why CARE was so successful. Uh, um, but before we go into that discussion, uh, Vadim, any reflections on viral hepatitis? Mm. Oh. <clears throat> uh, I, I was trying not not to speak about the prices of uh, antiretroviral drugs because of because we have uh, a very good tendency that there is a significant reduction in the prices. And uh, I hope that in nearest future there will be uh, possible to treat everybody with cheap drugs and effective drugs. But still we have a serious problem in surveillance, in, uh, in uh, estimation of uh, patients, and uh, also it's necessary to reach this patient. So we need a special program how to reach those who are infected with hepatitis C. Maybe there is it is possible to use uh, experience from HIV services in many of countries, but there will be a problem how to, how to reach all those thousands of uh, hepatitis C um, infected persons who are uh, who are in Latin, uh, latent uh, period, and uh, of course, it, it is a very interesting point for hepatitis C. Yeah. Thank you. No, thank you. And then, uh, as uh, Vladimir was just explaining, I mean, it's a, it's a daunting task, uh, Vladimir, that you have in front of you to lead that effort uh, in Russia. I mean, with the number of people who's infected. Uh, so. Um, so thank you for that discussion. And, and so before we round up, uh, again, coming back to uh, the point I was making before about how should we maintain this collaboration? Uh, the funding for care is, is running out. Um, I think we're all eager to actually build on what we have done. Um, reflections of how to do that. Um, um, because I, I, I think it's a, it's a really, we have been uniquely able to develop everybody uh, have really been great in establishing a collaboration. Uh, and also, and uh, just to put a few more words, it's, it's really important for me to emphasize this, that, you know, when we, when we started CARE, uh, the people, some people knew each other, but but obviously we became we became, we became one group. But what really have shown that this was successful is that people started to trust each other, uh, in the sense that that not only were we able to have an open discussion. I remember a very vivid discussion in Moscow in January of 2019 around some operational issues, and you know everybody was was there to try to resolve that issue. Uh, so as as one group, uh, which was great, uh, uh, and the way it should be. Uh, but, but the real trust actually can be documented quite clearly uh, because we are now moving data and we are moving biological samples across across borders and is comfortable around doing that because we can see that this makes sense to do uh, and that's that's in my opinion the biggest level of trust that you can have that you act in a collaboration that you actually feel comfortable around doing that and uh, i just think that that level of 
collaboration and camaraderie in terms of understanding that this is really important to do uh, and we're all comfortable to do it this way because it makes the most sense because it's a benefit for everybody if you do it this way uh, and if that means that some of data needs to move across borders or some samples need to move across borders fine whatever as, lo as long as we get the best research results out and that has been the spirit so how how do we maintain that <laughs> and and also how how do others maybe who is listening in on this discussion how can they help to make sure that we maintain a, a frame around what we're doing here uh, um, because i think that the contribution from the european commission the contribution from the Ministry of uh, Education uh, in, uh, Most, uh, in in Russia, um, as well as various national programs in Ukraine and uh, Georgia and Moldova, has really been instrumental. Uh, so it's not only us as researchers uh, uh, that has been able to collaborate, but it was also a matter of getting the different structures and institutions behind us to to work together, um, and and you know where we were sort of putting we were put in the middle to do it, but there was a framework around there. Us, how do we preserve that unique sort of entity, Nicole? I can see you have a vision for this, please. I'm not sure I have the right vision because I do not have the kind of the background of the, the, the care project, but uh, I can inform you on what's happening and some ideas that can um, raise commitment for funding is that tomorrow and day after we have a discussion on the new global strategies for HIV, hepatitis and STIs. So we'll discuss the new documents and uh, we also discuss the development of the new regional plan from 2022 to 2030. I think as part of those plans, we will have a section on innovation and research. And if we are clear what we want to achieve as a region, it should be there. Maybe not uh, all the very details, but the key focus area that we need to move to achieve the target in the region. Because when it's fixed in a, in a document that is signed by member states and had the contribution of all stakeholders, including civil society and partners, then um, it may be used for uh, resource mobilization on this topic. So the, the resources themselves, they can come from uh, European Commission, they can even come from uh, Russian government if uh, uh, Russia wants to contribute to the region uh, efforts for, uh, for research. Um, it can be funded by the different government themselves, by global fund, but it's, it's, if it's fixed in uh, in the document, it means that everybody has agreed that those are the priorities and it can help. So I don't have the magic recipe, but I think uh, fixing a kind of uh, an agenda uh, with key topics uh, would be useful. So I'm glad you mentioned that, Nicole, because I think we have that document for you. Uh, and I'm looking at Francesca because I know we have that document. Uh, so maybe it would be good, uh, Francesca, if you send that to Nicole so she's aware because we have been discussing exactly that. And that's not to say that that, that, that those research uh, uh, focus areas are the only ones, but at least that was the condensation within the, the team in care of what was important to maintain and develop on. Uh, so. Uh, and we have been spending over a year developing that, so we'd be very happy to share that with you. Um, but, yes, of uh, course. Thank you. Yeah. And I see, Jens, that uh, there is Anton Smozaleski uh, in the chat has also some comments. Yes, please. Anton. Yeah, yeah. Hi. Sorry, I was just... Uh... Just to add to Nicole, I think it's uh, a, a good opportunity uh, with this global strategy and a regional action plan to, 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 to bring all together and also the European Commission and ECDC and also member states, including the Russian federations and, 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 and all the countries. So if we, uh, if we place the stronger focus on the need for uh, collaborative research across the region, I think that's, uh, that's an important uh, thing to remember um, yeah, just just to compliment Nicole. Thank you. Over. 
So we had a very good meeting in Moscow in January 2019 before the pandemic started. Um, there was good representation from the senior leadership, both in Russia as well as the European Commission uh, and the delegates uh, in Moscow. Uh, um, and there was a lot of interest. Uh, but obviously, a pandemic can, can be very distracting also for the political prioritization. Uh, uh, but um, but I think it's now time to get back and make sure we don't uh, forget about what we actually have accomplished and, and which will, because I think everybody agrees on this call here, that we're not going to get rid of HIV, we're not going to get rid of uh, TB, we're not going to get rid of viral hepatitis anytime soon. So, so uh, if people believe that this is fixed, uh, they are delusional. <laughs> <laughs> As, as Churchill was saying, we are um, at the end of the beginning. Um, so, um, but certainly not uh, at the end uh, as such. Uh, so, Nicole, you have a com comment to make. Yeah, just to reiterate that tomorrow, the um, John Ryan, DG Santé, Santé uh, European Commission, has really insisted to be in the opening. He's very positive and supportive. So the not all of you may be in this meeting, but uh, the, there is a way to it will be broadcasted. It's, I think it's interesting to at least uh, hear what he says tomorrow, because that can be used also to raise commitment for uh, for those issues. And during the meeting, to have feedback on the need for uh, research as a region to advance the agenda. I think we need feedback from people from 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 the research uh, area uh, who can give that that feedback in the group discussion or in, in in the plenary so we need to leverage opportunities because as you said Jens, uh, covid uh, just uh, um, raised many other priorities uh, but when we have such opportunities we need to use them and and we will do thank you Hopefully today's seven hours have given a, a robust uh, understanding that there is a strong research commitment to continue this collaboration, uh, Nicole. So hopefully, if nothing else, if you can bring that back to uh, John Ryan. Madam, please. Yeah, I, I believe in the role of uh, uh, WHO. It's, it's very important that they consolidated us and uh, they produce the main direction of work and i hope it would would be so in the nearest future but of course it is possible to collaborate uh, between uh, among those who are uh, participating in this meeting and to discuss uh, different position so it's uh, i think um, so it's uh, a good way now we <laughs> now we uh, uh, started m more working in the internet, yes, uh, in our online discussion, and uh, maybe it's <clears throat> it's better for fast exchange of information. So I guess there are many of ways to collaboration in the nearest future, and uh, I'm waiting new new program uh, that we discussed now uh, and uh, of course uh, uh, coronavirus is very important but i hope uh, pandemic would be shorter than pandemic of tb <laughs> and hiv infection and uh, we'll stay with our uh, former problems like hepatitis AIDS and TB. So that, that's a, that will be a great future work on this. They are not conquered yet, unfortunately. So uh, I wish you great success in this work. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Thank you for that concluding remark. So, um... Okay, you took the breath out of me. <laughs> so, um, uh, okay. Um, any last? Uh, I can see Richard Berger. You have put your your camera on. Uh, you want to add to this discussion we're just having here? I wonder. 
was it just so we could see your pretty face? You need to unmute if you want to say something. Thank you. I switched on my camera because um, I was getting ready for the concluding words. <laughs> very good. So I'll turn it over to you then. Thank you very much, panel. Uh, great discussion. Uh, great, uh, great prospect. Um, I really appreciate that we have been working together. And if, if I could just say one word before I get, turn it over to you, Richard, and that's to you, Vadim. I agree that we should continue to discuss. Uh, having discussions is is um, is great, and that's important. But I, I think I've been working and discussing for years about with colleagues in many parts of Europe. Uh, but I have to say, in in care, what we did here was not only to discuss, but actually to work together on, on a joint data set. And I think that gives researchers a completely different way of discussing once you have a concrete question in front of you and you that you're trying to tackle. And I think that just gives it other layer on top of the discussion aspect. So if I, if I may conclude on that remark. So I'll turn it over to, to you, Richard, please. Thanks. Um, thank you very much, Jens. I, I guess um, Anton is uh, supposed to speak first, according to the program, and I certainly don't want to, to jump the gun. All right. Uh, thank you, Richard, uh, for the introduction. It's really hard uh, to speak after such a fruitful discussion, and uh, I'm very thankful to, for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, my name is Anton Yeremin, and I work in the Moscow Regional Aid Center, and today I was asked to share our impressions and thoughts uh, from the, let's say, field side of the project uh, between European uh, Union and Russia. Uh, so, as I mentioned, I work at Moscow Regional Aid Center, where we provide clinical care for patients with HIV from the Moscow region. And the Moscow region is the region of Russia located around Moscow. You can see the map on my back uh, that is quite a huge region. It has an area size comparable, for example, to Denmark. And in our center, we have more than 33,000 patients on antiretroviral treatment uh, with HIV infection, of course. And despite such a significant number of patients, uh, care project uh, has become the very first experience of our center in the inclusion uh, of patients to any international HIV cohort study. So this is the main point which we want to um, underline. For many centers, there is not so many opportunities to participate in a high quality research. And uh, for many of us, it was the first experience in international cohort studies. Uh, in our center, we are trying to scale up uh, the treatment program, the uh, implement test and treat strategy, as well as rapid ART initiation. We try to focus on engaging key populations and use a patient-oriented approaches to improve adherence and quality of life. But it is true that sometimes you, you just need to distance yourself to see things more clearly. And in that case, we want to say thanks to CARE that now we have a great tool for benchmarking the quality of care and now we can analyze the results and find opportunities to improve our work. Therefore, it's very important to, to, for us to obtain uh, data in, about our center and, and specifically about our region, because as we discussed before, there is a huge variety and there are huge differences between uh, different regions of Russia and different centers in Russia. Uh, participation in the project uh, allowed us to learn a lot. There is no secret, there is a problem rel of relatively small number of doctors and a relatively large number of patients. So due to heavy workload on the medical staff at the in initial stages, we faced some challenges. But later we have managed to restructure our work and uh, our center um, in order to collect all the necessary clinical data, data and samples. Moreover, uh, care emp empowers young doctors and scientists to meaningfully participate in uh, research, especially in HIV, TB, and HCV. And I'm speaking not only on behalf of myself, but also on behalf of many young scientists you heard today and uh, before at the meetings. Some of them also took part in internships and uh, in the leading European clinics and laboratories. And we gained knowledge and skills that we are already applying here in practice here in Russia. All in all, uh, CARE Consortium is a truly unique example of collaboration between countries and different institutions. 
Uh, I think that CARE has clearly demonstrated that together we are able to conduct a high quality research projects, reduce the number of structural barriers and uh, save the focus on the Eastern Europe and specifically, especially on the Russian Federation. Uh, with that, I truly believe that uh, today's meetings only sums up the first steps of the collaboration and these efforts, and we will find together, we'll find an opportunity to continue this important work. Thank you again and take care. Well, thank you very much, um, Anton. And um, uh, thanks to all of you. My, my name is Richard Berger. I'm um, the Russia and uh, Central Asia desk um, at the European Commission's Director General for Research and Innovation. Um, and I worked actually many years, for many, many years at the EU delegation in Moscow. And um, I was uh, together with other colleagues, uh, one of those um, uh, who were at the origin of this project um, back in 2018. And um, uh, Jens already mentioned uh, the very good conference we had um, in January 2019, the kickoff conference. Um, I was there in Moscow and I met many of you at the conference and prior to that. And I've therefore been especially pleased um, to be with you today at this uh, concluding event. Um, and so on behalf of the European Commission, but also on my own behalf, I'd like to share some thoughts and, um, and observations with you. Um, I've been very, very much impressed with the, with the very good uh, work and the important results of the project, uh, which I've been following in the course of the last uh, two and a half years. And I've also been very impressed with the meeting today and with the discussions that you've had today. Um, not only um, because of the, you know, the scientific um, uh, and policy relevant merit, um, but also because of the number and range of scientists and experts um, whom you've been able to bring together um, to this meeting uh, today. And um, I've also been pleased to see some of you uh, join the discussions today whose uh, comments and contributions in the public uh, debate and in the policy debate about um, uh, HIV, but also hepatitis C and, um, and tuberculosis, uh, we've been following uh, regularly and including in the Russian press and, uh, and with much interest. Um, so that's really um, something that you can be uh, truly proud of. Um, that you've been able to uh, bring together institutions and individuals um, uh, in, a, in a unique way. And so for that, um, I'd really like to express our and, uh, and my thanks and appreciation um, uh, to, all, to all of you, certainly to all the uh, participants and collaborators of the, of the project. Uh, those of you who have been instrumental in organizing the meeting today, and of course also um, our counterparts in the uh, Ministry of Science and Higher Education of the Russian Federation, um, who have um, provided funding um, for this project on the Russian side. Um, and apart from the obvious impressive scientific results of the project, um, to me, in my observation, and I've followed you know, these kind of international cooperation projects for many, many years, for more than 20 years, I've really seen it um, have a sort of pioneering um, uh, function, a pioneering nature uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, you mentioned it already a number of times in, in the discussions today. Um, the subject matter is a difficult one, um, scientifically, but also because um, in some parts of the world, um, the diseases continue to be socially stigmatized. It's not easy to talk about them. Um, that was made very clear um, during the kickoff uh, conference um, we had um, in January 2019. Um, uh, all the more impressive um, the, um, the common database you've been able to establish and um, the common standards that you've been able to work towards and against. Um, the time period during which the project's been implemented has been difficult for all sorts of reasons. Um, uh, the EU and the Russia relations are going through uh, not easy times. Um, the pandemic has had uh, an impact on all of us, on the work of all of us. But if anything, the pandemic has shown um, to, to all of us and to our public um, the uh, fundamental importance of, of science, of scientists, of scientific cooperation, and in particular, the importance, the fundamental importance of being able to freely and constructively work together scientifically across um, 
borders. Um, we certainly plan to continue to pay attention to the work you've been doing and to opportunities to valorize this work um, in the future. Um, that is one reason why uh, we are pleased that the two coordinators of the CARE project, um, uh, Francesca and Marina, have been invited to speak at uh, a meeting we'll have uh, in two days' time, actually on Thursday, uh, our, our annual um, uh, joint E-Russia Science and Technology Cooperation Committee, which will take place um, online. Um, and uh, both uh, Marina and Francesca will talk about, um, uh, about the work, about the results. Um, and it's uh, important that that is going to be raised at the... Um, at that policy and political level um, for it to remain uh, in the focus of our attention. Uh, our colleagues at the uh, delegation of the European Union to the Russian Federation also plan to post a press release after the joint committee meeting on Thursday about the meeting. Um, and uh, we plan for this to refer uh, to your final meeting today, um, the final project meeting and we hope that we will be able to provide the link to the uh, summary of the results and achievements that you've uh, uh, prepared and that you can be justly proud of. Um, uh, I can only conclude by saying that uh, in addition to the obvious uh, important scientific results of the project and the impact that you've had um, through the way that you've brought together institutions and individuals from uh, different uh, parts related uh, to uh, addressing these diseases, both on the scientific side, but also on the, on the public outreach side, um, will certainly serve as a good basis for further cooperation among um, scientists in uh, this part of the world and beyond, um, including through our new uh, framework program for research and innovation, Horizon uh, Europe, um, in which it will continue to be possible for our uh, colleagues and counterparts in the Russian Federation and in other countries of um, Eastern and Central Europe to participate um, and work together with uh, scientists based in the European Union. And with this, I'd like to conclude. Thank you once more again and look forward to the contribution that Marina and Francesca will be able to make the day after tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Jens, I, do you want to say the closing words from the project? No, no. I, uh, you obviously, together with Marina, is the lead here. So uh, please go ahead. Uh, You have you to thank you, microphone. Thank you, Jens. Thank you, Marina, for coordinating. Thanks to everybody for the hard work. Thanks for the to the people uh, joining today for their participation, their ideas, your ideas. And um, thank thanks, Richard, for what you said. And looking forward to the continuation of this hard work. Bye. <laughs>